All right, everybody, welcome to Wombat Goes Deep. This time we're going to be doing The Witcher 3, uh, Wild Hunt. I just recently finished it. Probably spent more time with this game uh, than I have with just about anything else in recent memory. I've been playing a decent amount of Grand Theft Auto Online lately, but I think the hours that I rack up there are largely down to load times more than anything else. Uh, I mean, it, it, a lot has been said. There's ink spilt all over the place about how great The Witcher 3 is and how it's super mega ultra fantastic. And uh, yep, he's just killed himself there in the background. Um, <laughs> don't worry about that. If you're just listening to the review, it's okay. It's not me. It's some other guy. Um, but yeah, it, plenty of ink has been has been thrown around about how good the game is. And I, I wanted to talk a little bit about that. Some of the things that, that do work and some of the things that don't. I think what gets lost in a lot of the game of the year pronouncements is that, um, you know, it's not a game that's without flaws. It's a game that certainly has... Uh, some shortcomings here and there, but it is, uh, at the end of the day, I would probably, if I did the game of the year sort of thing, it'd be my game of the year because it does so much right as well. It's about the best that we could have asked for, but we'll save the, uh, the glowing praise for later on and, and we'll move on into the review as normal. If this is your first Wombat Goes Deep episode, uh, I'm going to just keep my same old stuff, graphics, gameplay, story, uh, and then at the end we'll do a little conclusion segment. Uh, where we talk a little bit about how I felt about stuff. So moving on to graphics, um, it, it has to be said, and it goes, I think, without saying in a lot of ways, that this is one of the best-looking games uh, of the year and probably one of the best-looking games ever put together when you peg it to Ultra, especially considering the fact that it's an open-world game, that it manages to keep that graphical cohesion pretty well solid all throughout, anywhere you go, anywhere you look, you, you don't really run into too many corners in the Witcher 3 gameplay experience where you, you see the seams come apart. I mean, there are certainly spots and they're sort of unavoidable, but uh, compared to other open world games of the type, you know, you just don't run into, into too many problems, especially considering it's set in a wilderness um, that you're, you're dealing with shiny armor and leather armor and, and, and lots of contrasting textures and colors. You could, in a more modern experience, get away uh, with a lot more matte, uh, you know, and a lot more, uh, you know, sort of sameness of texture. And, you know, you might actually see a little bit more cloth, maybe, but there's a lot of different sort of textures of cloth um, in this game, and they all look great. Um, but obviously we'll, we'll roll through that hair works. I got to say it's one of those things that's implemented and that people, especially AMD card owners are very, very upset about, but I got to say, I, I love it. it. It really adds a lot of depth and a lot of interest to certain aspects of the game. Um, you know, furry creatures, especially just the look of Geralt's hair in a given scene, the way that hair moves around. It's a fantastic little piece of kit, as is Tress Effects, which was used in the in the Tomb Raider series. And there was um, an amount of complaining when Tomb Raider came out uh, to that end. But it's one of those things that I can't really bring myself to complain about. I, I like both of those frameworks. I would like to see them both implemented or at least uh, you know, some sort of a middleware solution where it is basically a hair-related, you know, processing package or both of them implemented so that people on both sides of the fence don't really have a problem to deal with there. But, uh, you know, they take up a lot of computation power. And if I did not have a very powerful computer, I would have had to leave them off and did for about my first half of the playthrough. But once you turn them on, you're like, oh, that's just fantastic. You'll you'll notice hair moving in a way that's, that's very, very satisfying. It's one of those effects that we've really been late to come to a solution on, but it adds a lot to the dynamism of a, of a given person. When you start to play a game and their hair doesn't move at all, and let me just say, uh, CD Projekt Red did a fucking fantastic job with just the baseline hair shader. It's very, very good. It is, as far as I'm aware, the best thing going. I don't think I've seen better hair done in just about any game. A lot of times you basically use um, a link, a linked, um, what do you call that thing, joint, a hinge joint kind of a deal uh, for, for ponytails and things like that. And it's just not really that great looking. It doesn't allow you to have actual flowing hair. And you, you really couldn't put that many of those joints together in a meaningful way because they tend to collide off of each other or not collide at all. I mean, they have a they have a weird sort of no in-between kind of solution. But um, I got to say, in this case, uh, even without hair works on, the hair looks absolutely fantastic in the game. But with hair works, um, it's a beautiful thing. It's I mean, it's an attention to detail that, that's become necessary. And it's one of those where I, you never really look at any of the characters in The Witcher 3 and, and sort of forget for a minute that they're not people. 
Uh, it's just not to that level of graphical fidelity. And I wouldn't expect it in an open world game, but you definitely look at them and you just think, man, they look great. Um, which is good because it means they haven't quite dipped into the Uncanny Valley territory, which you did get a couple of times in, in games uh, like Until Dawn, where every now and again things just wouldn't be quite right. And you just kind of go, Ugh, okay. But then it's back and then you're fine. But for those half of a second, you're just kind of like, okay, that's not quite right. But again, Until Dawn, nobody could complain about that. But there's also this lack of a need for dynamics there. Not a lot of characters, a very controlled environment. So operating within those confines, I got to say, Hairworks really adds quite a lot. No, no disrespect to CD Projekt Red on their hair shader in general, but they really did a fantastic job uh, of implementing Hairworks, and they've done a good job of optimizing it going forward. We'll talk a little bit more about optimization later, um, and, and really just a couple here. I got to say, the second thing that really came through to me is the fabrics are absolutely amazing. The only other game this year... Um, that, that came even close to sort of outfit design and texture and, and the work that, that was done there, I'd have to say would be Metal Gear Solid Five. Um, I'm pretty sure they both use the same, uh, the same baseline engine, which is essentially this fabrics creation engine that, uh, I forget the name of it, it's like uh, Maker or something like that, I can't remember exactly what it's called, but um, Master Taylor, I don't, rem I don't remember what it's called. Uh, I played around with it uh, for a little bit, but it, essentially it lets you lay out patterns exactly like you would clothes and then stitch them around a body and see how they're going to fall and see how the cloth physics is going to work all together. It's this amazingly complete, fantastic little package for putting together three-dimensional clothing. It lets you do it the, the same way that a tailor would do it. You know, you build um, a, a base, uh, what do you call it, pattern for the clothing, and then you actually stitch it together along those lines. Um, and it was used to fantastic effect here. I mean, you get seams in all the right places. You get cloth that really works realistically and, and a clothing system that is just really next to, you know, next to none there. It's, it's, it's well out front of pretty much anything else that's come out. Again, there were some good looking things in Metal Gear Solid 5. But I think uh, time constraints maybe got the better of them there. Possibly the console development. Um, you know, uh, made it so that things didn't quite end up looking as spiffy and shiny as they could have in Metal Gear Solid. But again, that's one of those games that, that that's, you know, in a close second place as far as clothing looks go. Um, but still doesn't quite get there. I mean, even the stuff you can see on screen right now, if you're, if you're watching the video version of it, you know, you've got this beautiful matte lighting effect across, across, you know, different sort of textures. It's shiny when it's a little bit more of a, you know, worked leather uh, and, and it just, it all works really, really well together. Uh, you know, the fabrics flow realistically. It's, it's very, very good work. And I, honestly, I think it's going to be state of the art for, for 2016. I don't think we're going to see a lot more in the way of modeled clothes. You know, those sorts of things that you'd see uh, in a game where, where somebody's wearing a dress, but each half of the dress moves with their legs, and then you just get a single polygon split in the middle that stretches along with their walk. I don't think we're going to see that too much anymore. Um, at least not going forward, at least not in AAA high-end titles. It, it, it's, it's something that is, uh, I think, by and large, going to fall by the wayside, and we're going to start to see this sort of clothing. But uh, really, it, it, it's, an, it's a thing as well that, that helped um, capture the atmosphere of the world that The Witcher 3 is set in. You know, everything looks the way that it should, and, and everything kind of fits together. It's all visually cohesive. Uh, in a very meaningful way. You, you never see a piece of clothing pop up and go, bah, bah, ooh, whoa, what's that? That's not what clothes look like. It, it all really works in there together. It's one of those sort of subtle things. So like I said, along with the hair, uh, that, that really helped drag you in. It, you see just the shine off of ring mail uh, underneath things right next to some, you know, some much more matte sort of scratched up leather uh, and uh, it's just, it's it, great. It's great. They look great together. You never really get tired of looking at them, even across a very, very large amount of gameplay. And you see different kinds of outfits here and there. Uh, some of the places they did fall a little bit short, I'd say were uh, undergarments, uh, things that were sort of more modeled onto the characters, uh, sort of had these fixed creases in them. Uh, you know, looser clothing, I think, had a bit more of a fixed crease look kind of kind of to it. And, and the wrinkles didn't necessarily come off in a particularly realistic way but I think at that point you're, you're kind of nitpicking beyond reason uh, it is something I'd like to see fixed going forward but hey they've got plenty of time to work on that stuff I, I think a minor complaint about clothing at large though is that Geralt has a lot of stupid looking clothes and there's not really anything that you could put Geralt in where I just think man 
He looks great in that. I, I really feel like a super badass right now. I mean, really, if you start to go into some of the more uh, heavy down the line quest armors that you don't even get a chance to unlock until until later uh, into the game, you know what I mean? You, you start to get stuff like the the Wolf School um, and I think the Griffin School armors. They're pretty good looking. But uh, you end up with a lot of sort of just generic armor that people would make, which makes sense given the world setting. But uh, it's still kind of, you know, you know, what I mean, I want I want Geralt to look like a badass and there's not really a whole lot of options for it. In fact, sometimes you you are really dressed like a fucking moron and you look real stupid, um, you know. Yeah. So uh, one more uh, one more good thing before we start talking a little bit about some of the problems that I ran into graphically, uh, the optimization over the course of release to patch 1.11 or 1.11, uh, which we're on now, is 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 a no small feat. It, it really can't go undiscussed. How much work was done? Uh, the same settings. Uh, if you load up even something as far back as 1.04. Uh, that would give you, say, 35 to 40 frames per second. If you load those up on the same hardware, you're going to be looking at almost a 10 frames per second jump in certain cases. And uh, I, that is just one of those things that you don't see in AAA and AAA titles anymore. CD Projekt Red had their team do actual engine work. And, and it makes sense, obviously. They're going to be working with this engine on their Cyberpunk. Is it Cyberpunk 2077 or is it just called Cyberpunk? I don't remember. And The Witcher 4, which they've recently suggested that they were going to be working on uh, after they finish up work on Cyberpunk and hopefully not before. But, um, you know, the optimization is no joke. It's a hard thing to do, and it's one of those things that usually doesn't get pushed out in a patch for a single-player game. Uh, it's, it's something that usually falls by the wayside because they sort of figure, okay, people have it, they can run it or they can't, so let's focus on building these optimizations into games going forward. Uh, in this case, it, it wasn't done. It was, it was pushed out along, along with the games itself, leading to very, very long patch notes sections at times. And I mean, there was a lot worth fixing and a lot that needed minor fixes in this world and uh, they've done it I mean they've really put a lot of work into the game uh, and you know we'll kiss their ass about that a little bit more uh, later down the line but uh, let's move into some of the some of the problems that I ran into that were was sort of annoying and seemed like they probably could have been fairly easily fixed um, you really regularly uh, run into the problem of the rain shader falling on people indoors. It's one of those things that I just found kind of annoying because it's especially obvious during cutscenes. Everybody's wet. Uh, there's water running off of the, the objects in the room because the, the rain shader has told them that they're under rain and that it needs to have the uh, rain running over it texture. Uh, and it, it's really, especially if you're in the middle of a serious cutscene, everybody's soaking wet and there's water running off of the bookcase. It's weird. It's just a weird kind of a thing uh, to notice. And it's it's a little frustrating to the point of I really hope there would be a way for them to fix it. I'm sure that they're well aware of it at this point and that it's just kind of a, it's probably a bounding situation where what they've bound as indoors or outdoors is sort of on the edge of it or maybe... One of the characters started outdoors, so it didn't really read things right. It's hard to say exactly what would have caused it, but it was a real, it's real one of those those visual things that you just kind of go, uh, okay, I guess we're gonna be wet for this cutscene. It's weird, um, you know. It takes me out of the cutscene. So I mean, I'm having a serious talk with Yennefer about our future as a couple, you know, or whatever. I, I don't want to be sitting there uh, going. Okay, why are we wet? Why why am I hearing? You know, I, I guess it makes sense. I can hear rain noises, or sometimes I can't. Um, and that ties in closely as well to one of the other issues that I had was the atmosphere system isn't really uh, up to snuff in general. Obviously, the rain shader playing indoors is a, a bit of a weird zoning issue and one of those things that could be fixed just by demarcating uh, where it's allowed to rain and, and where it's not a little bit more carefully across the entire open world. But hey, man, that's a lot of work. Um, but the atmosphere regularly fails to change. There have been a number of times where it's a completely blue sky and it, there's the thunderstorm going on. And sometimes they'd even remark on it in the game where, so the game forgot to queue up cloudy sky or foggy atmosphere, whatever. Um, so it's raining, quote unquote, but there's no actual rain playing. There's just the wet shader and then the rocks are wet, but the atmosphere hasn't actually changed to match any of it. Uh, again, it's one of those things that it's sort of, it wouldn't even be that bothersome if it just happened once or twice. If you thought, okay, this is a glitch, but it happens fairly regularly. And, uh, 
you know, I, I'd love to see it fixed up because certainly the atmosphere as part of a game like this is, is very, very important. So if it's rainy and cloudy, I want it to feel foreboding. I don't want it to necessarily just be a beautiful sunlit day and I happen to look wet. That's not necessarily, you know, uh, immersing me in the world. And, and let's be very clear, that's what they're trying to do, you know. So it's, again, it's a minor thing. I'd say in general, but when you're talking about trying to achieve the heights of perfect greatness, you got to get there. You know, you got to get at least a little bit closer than that. Um, you know, again, it's one of those oddities of open world games. We'll talk a little bit about open world games uh, in general as we roll into gameplay and how that can affect things. Um, I'd say the second biggest thing behind the indoor raid shader that became sort of comically annoying were LOD load in issues. Essentially, when you're sitting there looking at a cutscene, it would cut camera angle, it literally just turn the camera to look at somebody that's on the other side of the room or, you know, switch to an, obviously a different camera or somebody on the other side of the room. And then it would switch back, um, to Geralt sitting there. And the problem is about a half a second would be required to load in his beard or his specific haircut or sometimes, uh, for the, the detail on the armor to load back in and the shaders there. Uh, that's one of those things that, um, I mean, it's obviously basically they're over aggressive on the optimization engine. So those same optimizations that I praised earlier, they're coming back to bite them in the ass a little bit because as soon as you look away, it unloads the high detail Geralt so that it can load a room full of people, save a little bit of energy on something that's not actually in camera view. But then when it flips back, there's not enough time. It's not fast enough at getting that beard back onto him or getting his right hair cut back in. Uh, just right. And so you'll see situations where things load in in a fairly obvious way. And it just, you, again, if it happened once, you just kind of go, eh, you know, and write it off. But again, it happens regularly. It's almost like clockwork, really. And it gets to the point where it goes through comical and then comes back out the other side of hilarious and, and into sort of, well, I wish this would stop happening. You know, especially when you're in a serious scene, you just see his beard load in and you kind of think, doesn't, is nobody noticing this? Nobody. Nobody, Zoltan's not a little bit weirded out by the fact that Geralt's beard takes a second to, to come back in every time he looks away and looks back at Geralt. I, I could see that as being sort of a, a talking point between the two of them, at least at some point. Um, so again, the, uh, the LOD load-ins, it's just, ugh, it's rough. It's rough, man. It's, it's one of those things that I'm sure somebody that's a huge fan of the game is going to be a huge nitpicker about, but they're going to say, yeah, you just need picking on it. It's whatever. It's still the best looking game, but it's like, okay, but that takes me out of it. I'd honestly rather uh, a little bit of a frame rate dip when I when I turn away and I have to maybe turn some settings down than when I turn back. I, I have to watch somebody's face load in. It's not good. Uh, I consider that a bigger sin than somebody just having to turn the settings down a little bit more. Um, and again, it's it's not as bad as say like Halo Two was about that sort of thing, but uh, it's it's definitely approaching on it. It's one of those things that got ridiculed for Halo Two back then, and it deserves to be ridiculed now. Uh, LOD load ins is not, it's not acceptable to have pop in. It's just not, um, you know, and in this case it's, it's detail pop in versus core, you know, core look pop in, but it's still a problem. It's still something that, that I'd say needs to be addressed. I don't expect it to be addressed really, uh, anytime soon. Of course there will be one more, um, a DLC pack coming out or not a DLC pack, a little mini expansion thing. I forget what that was because there's hearts of stone and then there's the, the red one. Um, and I forget what the red one's going to be, but you know, I'm sure they'll address some of that stuff in there. Possibly, who knows? It could just be at this point that it's not worth fixing to them, uh, and that it's so minor and so few people have complained about it that they don't care. Entirely possible, but hopefully they'll listen to this one and then go fix it because uh, I care. I care. It's me, the one guy. This one guy. I give a shit. We're talking about we're talking about going deep here. We're not talking about just saying, "Hey, it looks great. It's a great looking game. There's some stuff here and there." No, we're going deep. Um, which brings me to another one, inconsistent texture quality. This is um, a, a plague upon every single game in the world. Uh, in this case, you don't really run into it too much. You'll see basically every now and again some logs and some barrels and things like that that are just basically low quality textures. They're the sort of things that you couldn't walk up to close enough. You couldn't get full frame and have it really look good. Uh, even if you have everything pegged to ultra, I don't know if that's a problem with texture load in or if the textures just don't exist. Um, so it goes with the lower quality texture, but, uh, either way, every now and again, you'd run into some inconsistent textures 
um, that, that were a little bit lower quality. And again, when you're standing around and it's in the background of a cutscene, it's all you can look at. You know what I mean? When you look at the, the open world and it's this beautiful, vast uh, wilderness that you're able to walk through, when you walk up to a guy and start talking to him outside of his you know, beautifully detailed hut, but that stack of firewood next to him is weirdly just kind of low resolution and kind of blurry, it, it fucks with you. It's all you can stare at. You look at his beautifully detailed face with stubble and... You know, he looks weird like he's some kind of a, you know, I don't know, survived the plague kind of middle European guy. And then you look over and there's a stack of, of 16 triangle, you know, logs with a 256 by 256 texture slapped around it. Uh, you know, it just doesn't get the job done. Uh, it pulls you out of the scene and it, it can really create a problem, especially in a game uh, like this where I really want to be a part of the story. I don't want to be distracted by what's going on in the background. I don't want to look around. And, and, and be taken out of what I'm trying to enjoy. Uh, and that's what happens there. And it's one of those things that, again, it's going to happen. There's so many textures in a game like this that it's, it's going to happen. But nonetheless, it's a problem. Um, to, to finish up talking about graphics, because I usually keep the graphics uh, segment a little bit short, um, I, I got to say we got to talk a little bit about the graphical downgrade. Uh, you can't talk about The Witcher 3, I don't think, without talking about the graphical downgrade and what console players hath wrought upon us um it's it's something that it, it ended up falling into the background and rightly so enough was said about the graphical downgrade that it's it's okay to sort of hand wave it now but not for me i'm a pedantic shithead and i feel like i'm really pretty upset by this uh, it's one of those things where pc was clearly the lead out development um, path here for the witcher 3 and i think for cd project red games in general and and based on sales you know we'll hope that they sort of keep it in that direction they've certainly been a faithful pc loving company up to this point and i'm sure they will continue to be in the future uh, they do get a lot of pc support and rightly so um, you know, it's the only place you're really going to get 1080p 60. Uh, the consoles are woefully underpowered compared to PCs in this generation. I don't see that ever switching around again, as, especially as the PC community picks up. Um, hopefully it gets larger, which will drive down prices as well. But the graphical downgrade is something that uh, it's a sadness for everybody. If you go back and you look at the original E3 trailer, you've got these fantastic, like, far-distance uh, smoke shaders that are in there. The lighting is fully dynamic. I mean, serious self-lighting beauty. No, not a lot of leaning on world lighting. I mean, the, just the, the, where the, there was the burning village and the wild hunt guy was walking around with his, uh, I'm going to pop my neck. All right, there we go. It was just getting stiff. It was getting stiff, man. Um, Wild Hunt dude was watching, walking around. He sighed and back and underlit by flames, but there's not really necessarily a, a bright world light in there. The primary lighting was was coming off of the flames. And you look at something like that, and you think, that was an engine. It was. But they had to pull some of that back and tone things down so that they could fit it under the Xbox. Uh, is, it, is the Xbox One the new one? Uh <laughs> I think it is, and the PS4. And that's one of those things where you can just go, okay, from a business point of view, I perfectly understand what you're doing. I get it. It just makes me very, very sad. There's been a lot of attempts to sort of bring back the E3 style lighting. There are lighting mods all the way through the roof that you can download and install. And indeed, I have one downloaded and installed, and it just doesn't get you back there. There's still too much missing in the way of particle effects. The world lighting is still what it is. And I mean, the, the in-game dynamic lighting is beautiful, and the more of it that you can get in there, the more beautiful the, games become, uh, the game becomes, but it, it never really gets itself back to where it should have been. There's too much global light, and that global light was put in. The global light and pre-rendered light, or, or pre-computed light, I should say. So there's too much of that going on, and there's really no way to pull enough of that back out through mods by themselves that you're really going to find anything satisfactory. I don't care how much work people put into it. it, it it's just going to be... Uh, Herculean at the very least you'd need to do a major lighting overhaul of the sort of subsystem turn off global light and then relight individual areas and scenes um, to come to a specific area and that's one of those things that they mentioned as well I mean they've come out and admitted that the console port was what made them pull the graphical downgrade into uh, into all the whole ball as opposed to trying to keep the PC up on this level over here they were just like okay well, we just had to do it there wasn't enough time 
And that was one of the things they mentioned as well when they were talking about one of the reasons they went to a global lighting setup. They, they, they found that having to dynamically light every single part of, the, of all of the open world maps, I should say, uh, that they have in the game, it was kind of taking them too long. And if they were also going to get the console ports out on time, they weren't going to be able to do it. And keep in mind, the game was delayed a little bit as well um, in the meantime. So, you know, it's, it's definitely not anything that you could argue that they just sort of made up to make you sad. Uh, it's a reality of game development. And it's a sad one at that. But, you know, the graphical downgrade was what it was. But it's definitely something that, that leaves you thinking... Jesus, what could have been? You know what I mean? Maybe they'll have time and maybe they'll have enough energy and maybe they'll have enough you know, funding this time around to get uh, that sort of thing into Cyberpunk or into The Witcher 4. Maybe they'll be able to optimize their engines well enough or, or their workflow really well enough that they'll be able to push out a console port. You know, Or maybe they'll be bold enough to lead on PC, but I don't think that's going to be the case. Sony and Microsoft are very, very willing to throw money at a company in the interest of saying, "Hey, you're gonna put, you're gonna, you're not gonna release on PC first. You're not gonna release on them for you're gonna release on all of our stuff at the same time." Uh, and I, I think that the guys at CD Projekt Red would be stupid to sort of take that money. I mean, a lot of people consider the graphical downgrade a betrayal, and it, it kind of is. But also, how many people are running PCs capable of, of handling that level of dynamic lighting? That was another excuse that they gave. That a lot of people are not spec'd out for that. And and looking at the way that the game comes out as it is. I can barely peg to ultra at uh, 2560 by 1080, keep things above 60 frames per second uh, on my 980 Ti and uh, 4790K, I think. I don't remember exactly which one it is, but you know, 32 gigs of RAM, pl plenty, of, plenty of room for most of the games that are out there. I can still barely keep that bad boy uh, on ultra peg to 60 frames per second, and that's, that's really only if I'm not doing anything else. Um, I could probably do it at my full 3440 by 1440 if I full screened it and gave it dedicated full screen. But again, you're talking about a very graphically intensive uh, game there. And so not necessarily the wrong decision, but it's definitely a, a graphical downgrade. And I, I wonder, given all that extra time to optimize the engine and get that stuff working in a way that it would either be, you know, you could turn it off, turn it on. Um, uh, I would like to see if they had been able to do that. Obviously, they weren't. Uh, we'll see what happens uh, in their future games. And uh, yeah. I said, that's it for the graphics side, boys. Let's, uh, let's move it on over to gameplay now. Uh, there's plenty, I'd say, to talk about about gameplay. It's, it's, uh, it's a well-done game. It's a well-done game gameplay-wise. Uh, and we'll break that down and talk about some of the good and some of the bad. Uh, I'd say overall the gameplay, the combat is the core part of your gameplay here. Um, the combat's far improved over The Witcher 2. It's like night and day, really. The Witcher 2 was flashy, and, and that's one of the first things that you'd run into, I think, when you started up a game of The Witcher 2 and you really first got into your fights. It was flashy, and you were like, oh, I look like a badass, but you realize very quickly that it's kind of hard to control and that while you feel like a badass, you're, you're not necessarily being your most effective. Um, you were punished really pretty hard for mistakes. The uh, controls were poorly explained. Some of them... Uh, a lot of them were kind of unintuitive, and if you missed them the first time, there was no sort of on-screen indicator of what it was that you were supposed to press to, say, use uh, your oils or switch your signs, which led to me actually playing a lot of my first playthrough of The Witcher 2, basically uh, with just sword play. I, I really, <laughs> I kind of just, I kind of just went straight for it, man. I was like, okay, I'm gonna just, I'm gonna just hit these guys with the sword until they're dead. That seems to be working. Um, and, and I'll try to figure out this whole this whole potion thing a little bit later on. In The Witcher 3, there's none of that. The user interface is, is well suited to uh, to the gameplay. It really gives you enough information on screen that you're going to feel happy with it. And you can turn off user interface elements. So if you're one of those hyper-minimalist psychopaths that really can't have any UI on the screen at any given time, you can do that. Uh, you know, you can do really whatever you want. So there's a lot of modification, a lot of modability, a lot of customizability in there that'll that'll make people really happy, I think, that care about that sort of thing. If not, the user interface has decided to eschew the sort of modern idea of let's just not have user interface on the screen. But when you're looking at something uh, as as varied and complex as an open world fantasy uh, RPG, it's, it's massive and there's magic and there's potions and there's weapon switching and there's all kinds of stuff like that uh you really need to have a little bit of ui on the screen and i, I gotta applaud them there for for taking the step forward and saying hey man we're gonna put some ui on the screen um 
and we're just going to, and you guys can just deal with it. If you want to turn it off, you can turn it off and be a weirdo. If you've got everything memorized and you know what you've got in which slot, good for you. That's great. Uh, for everybody else, we're going to leave some shit on the screen. Uh, again, it's, it's been sort of a no go zone lately. Uh, you know, UI, especially minimalist UI has been a large part of it. I think they've strike a nice balance, uh, this time around, uh, at least as far as things go there. Um, since I looked over and, uh, was reminded of it. Horse controls are terrible because horses are hard to control and terrible. So we could chalk that up to realism, but I honestly found riding Roach for anything other than the longest runs was more of an annoyance than anything else. Um, the game is at its baseline fun to get out there and play. Uh, but the fast travel system is, uh, is a bit janky to say the least. Um, uh, uh, I don't like how it works. You have to go to a signpost. Unless you install a mod, you have to go to a signpost to fast travel to another signpost. Uh, that's not enough that's not enough middle ground for me. If, if I'm I'm the sort of guy who's like, look, I get it. Once I, I, I did for the first 10 hours of the game, I rode Roach everywhere. I walked everywhere. I did minimal fast traveling, and I really soaked the world in. But then once I had soaked the world in, I was kind of like, okay, I get, I get it. It's beautiful. That's fantastic. Uh, I'm not looking for a random batch of drowners to hit. Um, and I installed a mod that let me fast travel from anywhere. And, um, you know, obviously that's one of those things where you're going to miss out on certain little random world pickups or certain world quests here and there because you're not running everywhere that you have to go. But it's a thing that I, I feel at that point becomes basically an artificial game lengthening device and, and is not necessarily in the best interest of the player or indeed the gameplay itself. Um, speaking of travel around the world, I feel like uh, the world map was largely underused and especially in a couple of different places. Uh, I forget if I mention Skellige in this. I'll have to just see where I end up after I'm reading it. But uh, there's not really enough reason to go exploring on your own if you're primarily story-driven. If you're the sort of person who wants to just go wandering around, if you have to 100% a game, then you're probably going to go exploring. But that's of your own volition. Uh, the game gives you reasons up to a point to go to certain areas, but there are certain areas where you're just never going to travel um, especially if you're trying to keep on the main storyline. And this is one of those problems um, with side quests in general and how they appear and when they appear. Uh, when a side quest appears, it's often in the middle of you doing some other quest. And that's something that you run into a lot with games in general. They'll hand you a little side quest and, and they'll give you something. They'll have somebody say, oh, kind sir, wouldn't you come here? And there's a certain sort of gamer that can just stop what they're doing and walk over to that person and pick up a new quest. I am not that guy. I can't do it. It feels very, very awkward to drop what you're doing and go over to somebody and just say, yeah, sure, whatever. I'm in the middle of saving the world. Let's hear what your problems are. You were shouting at me from the side of the road. It must be important, right? It's not like I'm riding around with a fucking griffin head attached to my horse or anything. So let's hear it. Oh, I dropped my bag, my bag over there on the ground somewhere. There's mud. Oh, and I can't go because it's so muddy. And, and then you're just kind of like, why did I do that? Why... Why did I do it? Why did I walk over and talk to this guy? I'm, I'm literally on my way to save some villagers from a pack of rape beasts. And, 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 and okay, well, okay, yeah, let's get your bag out of the mud. You know, these boots, okay, some of them will get raped, but we'll get there in time to save the rest of them. But again, the reality of, of the game is that you're, you're walking around in a world where nothing goes on until you get there. I, I, I understand that, but I don't feel like that. And the more I tell myself not to feel like that, the more I voluntarily pull myself out of the immersion of the world in the game. And I consider that a gameplay flaw. I consider that not something that I want to do. Uh, likewise, to the world map being underused, I think that Novigrad was underused. There were, um, there's just a lot there. Uh, and, and it does feel like a functioning city, but it feels like a city that functions without you. And I don't mean that it feels like you can take part. I mean, like, it feels like the world functions in a way that you aren't welcome there. You can walk up to a couple of different merchants and talk to them. You can go have sex with a couple of whores here and there. Super duper. That's great fun. Uh, and certainly any quest that you do while you're there will we'll have you in there take, taking part. But there's not a lot of casual things to do. I think the story is partly to blame for this. They make up the excuse that Radovid's taken over the city and that the witch hunters are waking, making their way in and that you're not really particularly welcome in the area. But 
it's something that that was really quite frustrating and and possibly Novigrad was the worst for the previous side quest appearance problems that I was having. I was I was on a mission with Siri where she's literally leading me around the city and, and it's the only time I went to Temple Isle because there's one other time that you would go up to Temple Isle and that's to look for Horson Jr. but I went a different route and wasn't sent up there. Um, so again, the game doesn't really send you places uh, that you don't need to go unless you take side quests. And I can, like I said, I consider that a problem. There's a lot of the world map that sort of went up you unused the smaller parts of the towns, and you can consider that fun. You can consider that sort of a an extra little bonus if you're the sort of person that wants to uh, wants to take part in that kind of stuff. For me, it just ended up being spots where I, I didn't go. I mean, you know, I'm walking around with Siri and some lady says, Oh, Witcher, could you help me from the side of my room? I'm like, no, I'm literally following a person somewhere else right now. This would be ridiculous for me to be like, oh, hold on, Siri. This woman might have dropped her bag in the mud. So I'm gonna have I'm gonna go have a conversation with her about that. Because that's important right now. Um, so again, Novigrad underused, the world map underused. Uh, again, I feel like Novigrad could have been one of those places where you sort of land sort of like uh, uh, the Golden Saucer, where there could have just been a ton to do um, and a ton of little fun customizable things there. Weirdly, I don't even think there's a barber in Novigrad. I think you have to go to Oxenford to get your hair cut. Uh, unless I missed the dude 900 times. I, I ran around the sort of lower segment of Novigrad nine or, nine or 10,000 times, and I, I never saw the dude. Um, so that's a little bit of a weird one, but again, yeah, it's one of those things where outside of, of immediate story quests, the side quests aren't necessarily interesting or rewarding, uh, unless you really want some extra flavor to the world. Uh, the, the core quests get you really deep into the sort of, uh, underpinnings of Novigrad and there are some side quests that you'll kind of do just as a sort of happenstance, but there's not a lot of reason for me to go wandering around. If, when I run into people, I usually run into people that have a single, just, one purpose sort of thing and that's it uh and, and then i i'd be run off uh and since i'm talking about that part of it let me see if let me scroll down here uh ba -ba -ba, epilogue story points burr, 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 burr. yeah okay okay i think i'm gonna Okay. Okay. I do. I do have it under my story section. So I'm going to talk about that under the under the story section. I just want to scroll down there and make sure uh, that that was the situation. Uh, there's a thing I'm going to talk about as far as how story progression goes and 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 sort of the the rhythm of the game and and how I have a bit of a problem with that. Staging uh, is still a problem for NPCs. Uh, and as in, if you ride up next to a horse and a cutscene begins, you will clip through the horse. Uh, AI flips out fairly regularly as far as pathing goes. And it's the sort of standard problems of open world gameplay. GTA V managed to avoid a lot of it with, not all of it, but a good chunk of it with some really solid AI work in places. You still have things where you'll run into problems in GTA V, but uh, I think there are more of them here, especially with clipping through people. People don't navigate around you. People don't consider you a solid entity when you're inside of a cutscene, and obviously that's just one of those things. I think that there's a potential solution for this and having a cutscene zone basically where non-essential cutscene members or at least the people that you sort of want in there are moved out of the way and then sub of that a character zone that people are forced to path around or that their at least NPCs will be pushed out of the side of it and maybe then they'll reposition themselves but they'll be forced to path around. Clipping through things in cutscenes is basically there are entire channels with hundreds of thousands of subscribers that are basically dedicated to pot smoking morons giggling at that happening. Uh, that's an entire subgenre of YouTube channel, which is just it's depressing. And it's something that could be fairly easily fixed, especially consider considering, you know, modern zoning technology and things like that. It could be worked on. And it's one of those things that I, I found really to be probably my, my biggest problem with with gameplay overall. Um, I, I didn't enjoy it when, I mean, you could call it graphics if you really wanted to, but I don't enjoy any time I run into a cutscene and somebody paths through me. It's unacceptable. If I get off, I'm, I, I literally was in a horse for half of a cutscene one time. It, it's not, you know, it's one of those things where I'm talking about serious stuff. I'm talking about the witch hunters trying to kill my friends. 
but I'm standing inside of a horse and nobody's addressing it. Nobody's talking about ghost horse or anything like that. And, you know, again, they shouldn't be because it's not supposed to be happening. But uh, something needs to be done there. I think there's some thought that needs to be put into that. I think it's something that CD Projekt Red can improve upon going forward. Again, it is part of the sort of current open world gameplay baseline problem. The AI is going to have trouble pathing through a complex world at some point. Uh, it's something that really what you need to do is start programming from a baseline to say, hey, okay, if, if the AI tries to find a path for more than this amount of time, just force them somewhere. Make them run in a straight direction. Don't have them you know, redo the path. Again, it's a bit of a complicated AI problem. That's the reason you see it in so many different places where AI will just run back and forth. Its state system can't help it make a change about where it wants to go and it, it sucks, but you know, it's one of those things where at some point it just needs to make a hard call about where it's going. Uh, it's a little bit frustrating. I'd say there was simplistic AI overall, however, in this game and that it could have been done a little bit better. You see a lot of the same groups sort of passing through um, as, as far as if I leave Novigrad and come back to Novigrad, people really run their scripts to the same part of the day. There's not really a living, breathing sort of crowd AI system. And it's weirdly one of those things where you actually see better work in this department in the Assassin's Creed games where they, they have decent crowd reactions that aren't quite so predictable um, and that, that are they, they feel a little bit more dynamic and um, everything really, really felt like an on-off bit as you walk through. I, I use Novigrad as the baseline here because that's basically the easiest place to, to make AI do things and react and have opinions. And obviously a lot of that's it's built on the same underpinning system, but you don't really have different sorts of people. You don't have, like, I can just pop off magic and get a reactable, or, or uh, what is it? Uh, 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 not reactable, a reliable reaction. There we go. Ugh, I mashed them together. You can get a reliable reaction out of the AI players every single time. The first time I cast Gwen on myself in a city, some of the guards will pull their swords and they'll warn me. And then if, you know, some people will go, bah! and some people, you know, flip out and run off. But I don't really have like, oh, this guy that decides that I'm a threat because he's, you know, been couched in this anti-witchcraft uh you know, religious fervor that's sweeping over the city and things like that. Um, you know, it, it's it's frustrating that way. Um, yeah. Uh, I would say that the UI could use a bit of working over there. I know to praise the UI earlier for being fairly readable, but especially once you dive into the inventory specifically, uh, things become very kind of complicated to use. There's a hover over tooltip thing, but it's not necessarily the best for quick use. If you're not the sort of person who wants to spend a lot of time in menus, you will spend a lot of time hovering over what items are trying to find the one that you're looking for. Uh, and there are mods to help out with that. But again, mods are, are one of those things that shouldn't necessarily um, come into play. And uh, just to address a, ja a chat comment going into this because I do live stream these guys. If you're interested in that, head over to youtube.com slash live. Check me out on YouTube. Okay, that's enough of that. Uh, Will Kelly says, um, I don't think any of the quests are rewarding item or XP wise, but there's some very well written contracts and side quests. And that's one of those things that I'd agree with uh, as far as gameplay goes. And, and I hadn't made a note of it, but it's good because it reminded me to talk about it just a little bit. There, there is a lot of very re well written work inside of this game, uh, but your items are lackluster pretty much throughout the entire game until you sort of um, limp past the uh, the sort of mission at Kaer Morin where you do your kind of final stand thing, but it's not really your final stand, and then you do another one later. But um, we'll talk about that. Spoilers, kids. There's going to be spoilers. It's a big, long, nine-hour-long review or whatever, so you, know, you probably kind of should have figured that out. Um, but yeah, it's uh, there's there's not a lot to reward you XP wise. Like you don't really roll through the levels as quickly as you'd probably like in a lot of ways. And, and the armor that you get back out of it doesn't necessarily look great because Geralt just has to look stupid for some reason. That's what they like. It's realistic. Um, and and again, that that sort of pulls the reward out of it. But they're very well written. So if you're interested in story, it's a good reason to go and look at it. But a lot of times you do end up getting a fairly shallow story or a fairly um, sort of minimally 
put together story or where there's a well fleshed out person who wants you to do something and they've got themselves a nice little backstory, but the quest itself still ends up being kind of the same thing. We'll get a little bit more into that as we move on to story. Ah, did you see that? Because the overlay changed uh, at the same time. It's classy. Uh, talking about the story, we got to run it back to the beginning, I think. Um, I'm not going to really discuss The Witcher 2 um, or The Witcher 1 or any of the novels in this uh, too much. Uh, I don't really care about the disparity between those two things. I think that the game has made decent enough points for the necessity of drifting off, uh, player choice being a large one of them. From the core novels, I've heard that the original author is not too happy with the game. Um, and certainly they, they keep things as tight as they possibly can. Um, you know, there's some changes made to how series story and for, it goes on, for example, and, you know, uh, stuff like that. So he can be as upset as he wants, but again, player agency is a part of the games. And, uh, so I'm not going to comment uh, really on any of that cause I don't necessarily care. Uh, you know, I'm not upset that you, you know, whatever with, you know, oh, but Siri, was more the focus of the books, and it should have been like that. Again, I'd love to play a game full of Siri. I think The Witcher 4 uh, is going to turn us in that direction unless they really come up with a really good for reason for uh, for Geralt to, to be around again. I think it would probably be a Siri-led game, but that's enough of that. Uh, the opening, uh, The Dream in Kaer Morhen, and the first bit in White, White Orchard are just a fantastic introduction to the entire series. And that's one of the beautiful things that the Witcher three wild hunt has done extremely well. Uh, I think you could kind of make the argument, but less successfully for the Witcher two, as far as you don't really need to have played the first Witcher game to do it. I mean, they give him amnesia for fuck's sake. Um, and there's nothing wrong with that. You know, it gives you a reason to, to bone Triss for a while, but, uh, you end up in a, in a sort of interesting spot where you don't need to have played the first one, but it doesn't necessarily wrap you into the world quite so good. And this one, I think the fact that they're not apologizing for the fact that there's a very wide world means that the introduction is much more meaningful. You run into Yennefer, uh, you have this nice little thing, that is fantastic little introduction to Siri, and then the introduction to the Wild Hunt. And all of it's done in a fantastically well-written way that is both casual and gives you a sense of character right away. You have a great sense of, of what Yennefer's like. You get a, a good idea for Ciri, um, as well as Vesemir and uh, the other two dudes, uh, whose name Eskel and Shitface, Lambert. <laughs> we'll call him Shitface, though. It's a good name for him. Um, but it, it, again, it gives you a really good sense of their character, it gives you a sense of who the Wild Hunt are in kind of a way. They're boogeymen. You know what I mean, and, and they're chasing, uh, they're chasing after. And then he wakes up, and you get into the real world, and and you walk into White Orchard. So you get an idea of who our core cast of characters are beautifully through this little dream sequence that teaches you how to play the game as well. Um, so a well written little introduction there, not only from a story game story standpoint, but from a gameplay standpoint, that then opens up into White Orchard and gives you the open world that you were looking for. And, uh, you know, after showing you some visually impressive stuff at Kaer Morhen, because you're not necessarily going to see the most visually impressive stuff uh, in Velen anyway. So, you know, it's a great way to introduce you to like, hey, look, beautiful sweeping vistas. That's what we're about. Interesting characters. This is a beautiful world full of interest and, and, and characters. And you want to be around these people because they're fun and powerful and interesting. Uh, and then it puts you into White Orchard, which is this great little microcosm of the real world where you're looking for Yennefer and you're kind of trying to find out what's been going on, where she is. And the fantastic part is you wake up from your dream and then you you move along with Vesemir uh, in this way that is really fantastic. The first thing you do is you run into a guy who needs some help and you sort of say, yeah, give, give us some money. I mean, obviously you're the witcher and you can say whatever you want, but it, it lays down that I'm a witcher. I do this for money. I kill the griffins for gold that's how we get our money that's how we eat that's what we do we're not you know we're, we're the a team it's an if you can afford us kind of deal um and then you head into white orchard and you hear about the griffin and you get sort of an immediate idea that things are are not quite good you, you, there's this war that was shown in the opening scenes and there's some people in the tavern who are a little bit upset about the fact that this lady is taking down uh you know the tamarian colors because they've been you know uh, taken over by the Nilfgaardians and 
you know, again, you get this great sense of the world and this this bar that is a fantastic microcosm of the world at large. So again, it tells you a whole lot about how the sides look, how the witchers are perceived in the world at large, what they're there for, which is primarily work, while they're looking for Yennefer. So you get to do all that. You get to learn to play Gwent, which was a waste of time, and I didn't do it, and I learned to play Gwent later. So whatever, eat that white orchard, and I missed out on some Gwent cards, so fuck me, I guess. Uh, <laughs> but you know what I mean? And then you head out and you talk to a guy, and you end up in this very, very interesting um, sort of, like I said, uh, microcosm of, of the world. Uh, you, you know, you go to the, the inn and you talk to the guy and you help out with the Griffins and then uh, Yennefer comes and you go and you talk to a mirror and the world slowly blooms out in front of you as this much larger, deeper, more interesting place that where people have their own problems. It, it establishes a lot of depth in the world and, and it does it without patronizing you as a player. It's all there for you to see and it's all there for you to understand, but it's never explicitly said. Nobody ever says, hey, Witcher, things are bad here because of these reasons. There is a war happening. And you know what I mean? It's, it's said, but it's not said to you. It's not put on screen in text. It's enacted in the attitudes that people have about certain things. They don't explicitly say that, you know, the Nilf Guardians have taken over this area, so these people are upset with this bar woman because that shield belongs, you know, she took down the Tamarians, so, so these people are upset with her, but she's just trying to run a bar, and these guys were going to attack her if she didn't take it down. Again, all of that's, it's there. And, and it's well laid out, and it's really, really beautifully done. And uh, it's... It's just it's it's a it's a great intro to the game in general and the game really is very very aware of sort of the tone and the world in which it exists that there are things that are going to continue to go on where there are people who aren't necessarily as affected by the war as other people it's it's something that you don't necessarily see all that often you'll see a lot of bedraggled sad people but they do make sure to show that there are people that aren't really affected by it. a lot of people in Novigrad don't necessarily care. They're scared, so they're willing to allow this guy, Radovid, to burn witches and, and mutants and uh, non-humans because, you know, they've been terrified. You know, the Nilf Guardians are beating down their door. People are dying, and if there's somebody to blame, it's the witches. So let's, okay, let's do that. That seems like the, maybe the gods will be on our side and we can do something about it. Um, so in the middle of all this sort of thing, um, you know, the, the play... You, you end up putting on a play in Novigrad, something that really, it, it serves story and that you need to get Dudu, the most ridiculously named creature in the history of time, uh, to come out of hiding and, and help you out. Uh, so you put on this play. It really lightens the mood. People are kind of making fun of you. And, you know, there's this whole undercurrent of like, hey, it'll be okay. You know, yes, this serves a purpose, but also it's fine. People love a good show. Um, you know, and, and you get these little side moments where the, the tone just gets lifted just a little bit. The mood says, hey, man, there's more going on in this world uh, than grim faces and serious storylines. Even though Ciri's in a lot of trouble, we can take time out of our day to do things a different way. You know, we're not just going to go punching and stabbing people uh, to get to the end of a problem. And, and that's one of those beautiful things to see. Uh, you know, it, it, it follows in the footsteps of, of some of the most interesting writing where you're not necessarily the solution to every answer isn't necessarily pull your blade out and shove it through somebody's throat. And, and one of the ways that that's really driven home in a fantastic way is by your inter, your uh, interactions with, with Dijkstra, who is he's become if you followed along in the earlier games, he's become an underworld boss in Novigrad. I forget what he's going by now, but because uh, they call him Dijkstra basically the entire game, but he's, he's changed names. Uh, he's got his little evil underground guy name, and, and you go there and you find him, and, and again, you can pretty much sort of strong arm the dude anytime you want, and you can strong arm a lot of people pretty much anytime you want, um, you know what I mean, and certainly you can beat anyone in a fight, but that's not always sort of the best way through, it's a way that you could get through, and I don't think it would change the game too much, but if you want to really work around that sort of thing, um, you don't have to fight. I love that sort of thing. Uh, you know what I mean? I, I love it as an option. I love fighting. Don't get me wrong. That's fun. Putting a bullet through somebody's face when they're being a cunt to you is is uh, something that I do way more often than I probably should in, in like Mass Effect games. Like, yes, I will blaster you in the face because fuck you. Don't, don't fuck with me. You know what I mean? But also sometimes I just want to be like, look, you're a valuable guy or maybe I just don't even dislike you. So we're going to let's talk this through. Uh, that sort of a thing. 
Uh, I will say, though, that the game and its message about how sometimes, you know, the war is bad over here, it's, you know, whatever, you're a witcher, it's not that bad for you, sometimes it does get shoved into your face a little bit too blatantly. Every now and again, you'll have somebody that says, not everything's wine and roses, and which maybe it's different for you, witcher. I mean, I don't know how many times somebody has reminded me that shit's really tough for them and I couldn't possibly understand it. That probably happened a, a few too many times um, for my taste. Uh, I, I would prefer if, you know, subtlety stayed subtle and that you didn't necessarily tell me that, yes, war is hard over here and that I may not have been quite so affected by it. You know, like everybody kind of treats me like a moron in the game. And Geralt's not necessarily a stupid guy. You know, he's a fairly intuitive dude. He, he understands when things are wrong. And certainly that's an option pretty much any time somebody has a problem. I, I just find it very difficult. You know, I don't know. It's it's they could have done better. It, it happened a little bit too much, and I, I imagine with the work spread out across any number of writers, that you're going to run into that from time to time. So we'll, we'll let it go. Um, uh, just to talk a little bit about one thing that really bothered me too, uh, while I'm while I'm complaining, Isle of the Mist uh, is such a kind of annoying thing, and and it, it is a microcosm. I'm going to stop saying microcosm. I promise of the my annoyance with the quest theme of the game it's it's kind of hard to lay it down so i'll explain myself properly here when you go to the isle of the mist i cannot think of another thing that encapsulates the entire way that the game's questing works other than this you knock on the door you say hey let me in uh there's some dwarves inside and series in there as well you'll find out uh and you go, oh, hey, guys, let me in. What's up? I'm here. Uh, I'm looking for somebody. And they're like, do something for me first. Hello and welcome to the entirety of The Witcher 3's quest line. It, it is 100% walking from place to place and either having randos insist that you do something for them for very little pay or for no good reason or going somewhere where you actually need something and when you need the thing from that person, they go, hey, do this long and involved series of quests for me first because that's what I would like for you to do. And, and this happens, I think, almost 100% of the time. It's probably at least mid to high 90s as far as percentage-wise. Even your friends, even when you go to them, you're like, hey, Dandelion, you're a worthless bag of shit who has literally no problems in his life. Um, I mean, he was arrested, whatever, it doesn't matter. Hey, help me out with this thing. And he'll go, hey, that sounds great, but I need you to do some stuff for me first. And you're just kind of like, why don't you go do fucking yourself and and just just tell me what I want to know. Just fucking tell me what I want to know or I'm going to start cutting pieces off of your body. If that was an option, oh my God, there's so many times I would have taken it. The third time I come back to a dude and he's like, you're almost done with the quest, witcher, you? but now you got to do this third thing. And I'd just be like, okay, fuck it. Which finger do you want cut off? Because I'll start with that one and we'll see where it goes. We'll just see where the night goes. You know, we'll just, <laughs> you know, if this is how you want to do it, we'll just fucking start cutting stuff off of you until you decide that you want to tell me where the fuck the thing I want is. Okay? Seriously. Fuck's sake. You need one piece of information out of a person. I don't care if that guy doesn't have an, a hand or an arm for the rest of his life. We're going to start notching things away at the, at, at the joint until he tells me what is going on. But it never happens. The whole time you just you do quests for people or they threaten not to tell you. And it's just like, are you serious? I could stab. I could. I could. I have mind powers. Are, are you serious? Anyway, it's fucking... Uh, it's frustrating. It's a frustrating part of the questing system, and it's one of those that didn't even really start to grate on me too much, I'll say, until I'd say the, the latter third of the game or so, maybe maybe latter half of the game, it really started to kind of drag me down because it's just so like, okay, I get it, you go somewhere, yeah, okay. I mean, if that's your writ, great, but it, it made things really, ooh, pardon me, really predictable. Um, you know, every now and again, you're allowed to use Axie to skip stuff, but you're only really allowed to use Axie in a very specific situation. You're allowed to use it, uh, where you would otherwise have to pay or would otherwise have to fight. Um, so minimally useful. It's not really one of those things that you can use on core quest people, uh, even though it should hypothetically work on them. And they do give you some, some choices as, as far as what to do in, in some situations. But again, uh, the quests are very much down the line. There is a type of quest. There is a type to this whole thing. Um, and they do not deviate from it 
um, particularly often. I found it very, very frustrating uh, towards the end of the game, especially because you just you run into things where you're like, look, this is actually breaking flow a little bit for me. And again, in the last chunk of the game after the battle at Kaer Morhen, that um, stopped being the case as much. But it was still very, very frustrating. Um, but, you know, we'll talk a little bit uh, more about questing stuff uh, as we roll along here. I do want to point out an example of some of the perfect, pitch perfect tone shifting uh, that the game does. Um, so uh, you have the battle for Kaer Morhen. There's this big fight that that really could have been the end of the game. And we'll talk a little bit about that in a minute. Um, after the battle of Kaer Morhen, you have just a fantastic little moment with Siri. Everybody's serious. Vesemir's dead. Um, and, and then you have a little snowball fight with Siri. It was just one of the best character moments in video gaming, bar none. Um, and it establishes this idea and really drives home this idea that, that, um, the Witcher, God damn it, Geralt, there we go, is the only guy, he's the only person really who, who gets Siri, who knows how to make her laugh, who knows how to bring her up from a bad moment, you know, other people just kind of keep pressing on her, or they say the wrong things, and, and he just knows that, you know, there's some stuff that he knows and, and the way that he treats her, it's one of the most fantastic relationship moments uh, in any game in a great sort of, you know, kind of father-daughter kind of way. It, it's a really, really beautiful little moment, and then you follow up that snowball fight with getting revenge for Vesemir, and you can complain about it, and you can kind of tell her that you don't want to do it. Um, but you know, I mean, really the game sets you up in a big way with that snowball fight to say, you know what? Yeah, fuck it. Everybody's treating you stupid. Let's, let's fucking go prove to these people that we know what we're doing. Cause I'm re cause at this point in the game as Geralt, you're really getting sick of being told that you don't know what the fuck is going on. Let me tell you how many times you will be told in the Witcher three that you're, Hey Geralt, you don't understand anything stupid. And you just are like, I okay, I'm going to shove a silver sword through any part of your body that I feel like needs a new hole in it. I know what's going on. Fuck you. I'm, I'm not six. What the fuck is wrong with you people? So, you know, again, it makes Siri a great, uh, a great companion there because you spend the entire thing getting treated like a moron. And then Siri comes around and you just go, I guess we're, we're the morons, right? Us two, just us two witchers. Everybody else knows what's going on, but us, I guess. Um, so you have this great little snowball fight and then you get revenge for, for Vesemir and then you're, you're on to dandelions, which is this nice little, little break where you, you head to the city and you kind of get a chance to, to walk around and, and, and you know, just kind of do stuff, right? It's not straight back into the fight after Kaer Morhen. It's just fantastic tone shifting with this serious, oh, Vesemir is sad. And then you have this little heartwarming snowball fight that, that shifted tone so perfectly that you can't help but just fall in love with that entire sequence. There's nothing better than it. You don't really care if you win or lose a snowball fight. I won because fuck you. I'm real competitive about snowball fights. Um, you know, and then you, you go and you get some revenge and it's a fairly satisfying thing in general. Um, uh, great tone shifting. Just one of the, one of the most perfect tone shifts I've ever seen, uh, in video games far better. Um, you know, in my mind, I, I love Metal Gear Solid three, uh, snake eater, but in my mind, Metal Gear Solid three, ends um with that fight with the boss uh you have your little stuff after the fact uh, but that entire sequence on the airplane where where ocelot's retarded ass shows back up on the plane that's all i repressed all of that it was like no 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 you have the fight and then you have the final cutscene <laughs> where where she left the tape for you right that's it that's the <laughs> that's the end of metal gear solid 3 to me um, you know what I mean? This is, this is one of those, one of those perfect tone shift moments, uh, like you had, you know, where, where the tone shift went from this sort of feeling of glory and, and completion that you had, even though things were a little bit confusing, a little bit terrible, uh, and, and snake eater to having to fight the boss, which is a tone shift down. This is a tone shift up and it's just handled perfectly. Uh, one of the other things that I will, as we move on in our talk here about uh, the Battle of Kaer Morhen, one of the other things is they had the perfect chance to end the game at the Battle of Kaer Morhen. One that felt natural. It would have led to, I'd say, a fairly short main story, but a still an enjoyable main story and one that with side quests and exploration, nobody would have balked at in any way. I mean, you literally go to a part of the map that you've not been allowed to freely travel to up to this point. Uh, to, to, to do this final battle. It's, it's an insane, literally in, in the, the sort of 
annals of gaming history and even in, in general storytelling, everything ramped into the Battle of Kaer Morhen being the end of the game. Um, you know, a heroic final stand where you overcome uh, crazy odds and they didn't do it. That's a weird one. You know what I mean? Uh, it's a really, really weird turn that they didn't go that way. And I got to say, when they didn't go that way, not taking that out, put this game uh, head and shoulders above anything else in the storytelling pack. It, it subverted my expectations so much that when the game kept going after that, when somebody said, we've got to talk about what we're going to do next, I was genuinely confused. I really was like, wait, what? No, no, no. We like, cause we kind of, you lose the fight and you know, Vesemir dies and they all leave and you just kind of think, oh, okay, no wonder they're talking about the Witcher four. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. The story's not done morons, but they don't, they, they, they keep going and it's just fucking fantastic. I mean, you, you end up extending the story out for another, I'd say uh, fifth or so, you know, it's, it's not quite as much content on the other side of it, but it certainly gives you a chance to go and finish up things. Uh, that you haven't completed to that point. Um, and, you know, they even give you a warning. They even say, hey, some story stuff's about to happen that you won't be able to come back from. So make sure you save here before you go into the Isle of the Mists. And, and, and you know, it's such a mislead. Uh, it's such a hilarious sort of like, oh, fuck, they kind of got me in a way thing. Uh, you know what I mean? And, and, and the best part about it is not only do they keep going after the battle of Kaer Morhen, they, they keep going in a way that's, that's satisfying and story rich and finishes things up. Um, uh, yeah, it was, uh, it was just fantastic. Uh, I'll talk a little bit right now about, um, the love interest and characterization in general in the game, uh, before I get into some, some story things that, that kind of bothered me uh, a little bit, but we'll, we'll roll through uh, those on the way down towards the ending of the game. Uh, the love interest uh, is very, it's a very interesting sort of thing. You get to kind of have a uh, casual sex with people, which is nice. Um, but essentially you're dealing with Triss and Yennefer. I mean, that's, that's what you'd expect after the second game. Uh, you know, if you knew what was going on, you would be versed in that. I, I imagine there are a lot of people that didn't necessarily play the first one. There are a lot of people that just came on um, with the third game and, and haven't played the other two. So you end up in this situation where you have two very different kinds of girls. You have Yennefer, who is sort of Geralt's, you know, destined love. In fact, they're tied together by uh, a genie's wish. And they're not really sure how that affects how they love each other. And that, that becomes a whole storyline. But the sort of underside of that that I love is that it creates a real conflict in people who don't necessarily haven't necessarily made a strong point or don't necessarily know who the characters are at large. If you've read the books or if you know even you sort of understand a bit of the wider world, you'll know that Triss isn't necessarily everything that she appears to be. She seems kind of like a happy-go-lucky person, but in reality, you know, as much as people seem to think Yen gives Geralt shit, Triss is a person who has been very much using him for her own ends for a very long time and just kind of happened to fall in love with him in the meantime. Uh, that's one of those things that you can kind of choose to ignore and just go, well, I like redheads. What are you going to do? She's a party girl. She's super fun. Um, and uh, you know what I mean? If you see people who are bigger fans of the series, uh, there's been some pretty funny comics put together about the scene that they have uh, in the garden in the Witcher three during the party where you're uh, helping uh, a Baron's daughter escape. Uh, son, son escape, Baron's son escape, or Baroness's son escape. There we go. I, I swung it back around. We got everything taken care of. Um, you know what I mean? So you spend a lot of time with sort of Triss and Yen, and in and, and this game you see that sort of really core thing, but Yen is written absolutely beautifully. Triss is the same Triss she's always ever been. She's, she's deceptive, but still seemingly pure at the same time. She's a very interesting sort of confluence of, of, of character ideals. Like she wants to be better than she is. And that's a very interesting thing. Like she'll still do what she needs to do to get what she wants. And in ways that makes her almost worse than Yen. Yen is one of those people who's going to be very straightforward. And that's the problem that a lot of people have with her, but they write in just enough of these little moments with Yen, these little lingering looks, these little, kind of she just makes sure every time she goes a little bit too far it's so easy to hate yen if you don't pay close attention every time she goes just a little bit too far they make sure 
to have her apologize or to say thank you or, or to just make sure that Geralt knows that she knows she's kind of a cunt and she's not sorry, but she loves him. And it's, it's just maybe one of the most fantastically subtle pieces of character writing that I've seen in a game to this point. It doesn't rely on anything big. There, there, there is no sacrifice in her character for player comfort. And, and I mean, that, that goes through the entire game. You have things that are, you know, becoming unacceptable, uh, according to shitheads who think that things like internet petitions are an actual valid attention to oh you poo we got ten thousand signatures saying titties are bad those people go fuck the themselves but again it's it goes beyond that you know they have they have whores in the game and they have all that sort of stuff so that's great but this goes beyond that this goes into the realm of writing a character that's hateable on purpose and and and, and yen is that yen is easily misunderstood and yen is the sort of character that you could really hate easily if you don't pay attention to her it's the same with with Dijkstra you know what I mean the guy's straightforward but he's fair that's the same with the Baron there are a lot of characters in this game who are very easy to hate if you don't pay close enough attention it, it, it takes the faults in people and the sort of normality and the weirdness of people and, and plays with them and puts them in front of you and says hey have a conversation with this person who you know for all intents and purposes seems kind of like a dick in some cases, they are a dick. But, you know, again, that's one of the reasons that it really sticks out with Yen. There's not really a way to get away from her. You know, you can always just stop talking to the Baron and stop doing quests for him and refuse to help him. Uh, you know, but with Yen, you got to kind of keep coming back to her. She's a core part of the story. She's your love interest. You know, she's one of them. Anyway, so just seeing the character writing on that and on plenty of other characters as well, it's it, there's a depth there that you just don't see in other games. And honestly, I don't even think that you necessarily saw as well realized in The Witcher 2. I mean, it was a real step forward for character writing in games, and, and that's one of those things that I haven't necessarily seen talked about. I find it a little frustrating. Um, you know, there's a depth to the world, and I will say that some of the side quests are a little bit samey, and they try to work as much depth as they can in, and they do in a lot of places, you know, again, the Baron's one to go back to. He's not a major character um, in, in a lot of ways. But, you know, he interacted with Siri, and there's some depth to him. There, there are problems for this guy. And any, any sort of side quest that's more than a one-off, go up here, clean this out, give it to me kind of thing, they'll throw a little sort of token depth into that. But that's because they have a rich world to work with. It's not that hard to do. It's that actual sort of duality of a persona that, that you have to deal with. The reality of a person who you've spent more time around than 10 minutes that's the sort of thing that starts to come through and some of the npcs that, that it's just hard to express how important that is uh, again yin is so easy to hate but they make sure that you know that somewhere under that veneer of she just she knows she's a bitch she knows it and she's not sad about it but she loves Geralt. And she's going to tell him every just, just often enough. She's going to make sure that she knows that she's overbearing. She doesn't apologize to other people. She doesn't say thank you to other people. She takes from them and she tells them what she wants. And at times that puts Geralt at odds with the people around him because he does love her. You know what I mean? It's, it's, it's such an interesting character dynamic, especially when you get back to care more and with her and you're dealing with people, um, like uh, Esker and and Vesemir and Lambert, who you know don't necessarily like the the way she is, and you're kind of holding the thing, going, "You got to get to know her." <laughs> you know, once you get to know her, it's fine. And it, it's never really been true in a game in a lot of ways. But uh, you know, again, I'll say GTA Five is probably some of the closest. But GTA Five, and that would be with Michael. Nobody else really. Uh, Trevor's kind of straight down the line there's some depth to him and that he's a tortured soul but he's too far gone to be brought back whereas that's the interesting thing about michael in gta 5 he's a man on the brink and there's a lot of interest there i'll probably end up doing a wombat ghost deep review on that later on at some point but uh it's just a beautiful there there's such a lot of great character writing in this game that, that really hasn't been approached on that scale uh, before Zoltan's a fantastic guy full of flaws. I, I would honestly play an entire buddy cop game of Dandelion and Zoltan. Uh, Zoltan, that just seems like 
something I would spend like five, six hours playing, just like a straight, a straightforward single sort of thing with them. I would do that. Um, but again, uh, moving away from that and continuing on with this thing so that I don't ramble for too long, even though that's probably part of why you guys come here. Uh, the lack of voice variety I found a bit frustrating at times, not overly so it's a minor quibble, uh, to say the least, but you have a lot of sort of West country accents and that's fine. And, but you get a lot of the sort of same gritty, what are you doing with ya? You know, that guy, um, you know what I'm talking about? It's that guy 900 times. Don't worry. I'm not trying to do a good accent there. That's, that's bad. I'm kind of on purpose, but, uh, you run into that guy a lot. You know, you, you, you sort of have an admittedly open world game, not that upset about it, but you just wish, you know, you wish for a world where they got a little bit more variety in there, uh, in the, in the department of, of, you know, voice variety, just so that I could run into, it. I didn't run into a lot of guys who just talked normal. There weren't a lot of those guys, a lot of gruff voiced, angry sort of West end of London or, or, West country people as well. Um, sort of both of those, but yeah, so that's enough of that. That's enough of that. Let's, uh, let's talk one of the things about, about the sort of mix of gameplay and story that really, really bothered me. Skellige, uh, is a place where I became really sort of disconnected from the game as, uh, I wanted to play it versus how I should have played it to get the most out of the islands. And being a dude who's, you know, always kind of in love with Ireland and that whole sort of thing, Skellige is obviously based, um, you know, especially in, in the Witcher 3 games to an extent off of the British Isles in Ireland, but uh, very much Ireland in this case, especially with the clans, uh, a little bit of Scotland mix in there as well. But I was, uh, the entire experience of Skellige was essentially crippled for me by the distances that you're expected to travel for side quests. Um, it, it makes me sad because I felt generally disinterested in the issues uh, brought up on the island. I liked the sort of the look of things and the culture on the island, but they were so... The, maybe it was the timing that they were brought in. It just didn't really feel that good. I was there with Yen, which makes me feel like I need to go to where Yen is and do stuff that Yen's doing. Um, so you end up in the situation where you're looking at, um, they're, they're deciding on who's going to be the new, the next king or queen of, uh, of the Isles. And there's a lot of boat travel. There are not a lot of opened up, uh, automatically. You can buy, I found out very, very late in the game, some stuff off the sort of wandering, uh, salespeople. Uh, you can buy access to the, uh, fast travel points. Um, and that may have honestly saved me some time, but I just didn't see him my first time through because I was so busy trying to put on the right clothes and head up there to meet Yen for the thing that I didn't actually stop and talk to the guy um, to, to to buy stuff from him. And I didn't end up looking at it. So I, I became, I just sort of washed the issues of the islands to the back of my mind. I was like, oh, I like Sarah. So it'd be good if she could be in charge because she's a hottie with a body, a cutie with a booty. And I'd like to, you know, you know, maybe she's the head of state. Maybe I could get some head from the state if you know what I'm saying. <laughs> Solid reviews, people. That's why you're here. Um, but I largely let it all fall by the wayside as there seem to be more pressing things going on. And that's one of those th things where, where story momentum trumps everything else. Uh, you land on Ard Skellig when Yennefer's there, and you don't really go anywhere else for that first trip. You, you do come back later, but once you come back later, again, you're, you're, it's like, okay, the guys from um, Nilfgaard are here, and all the stuff that you were supposed to do the first time around that I didn't do, you no longer can do, uh, which ties into a problem I had a little bit Ooh, later on, which we'll talk about, um, as far as just sort of game problems, story problems that 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 ended up in a weird spot. Um, but I felt sad about that as I got later on into the game because I really knew in the back of my mind I was like, oh, God, there's some important stuff going on here. They're trying to decide who's going to be the king, um, and I'd really like to have some influence over that, and I'd like to sort of push the story in that direction because I'd like to see the people that I like be in these cutscenes that I know are going to happen later on in the game. The problem was I was on Ard Skellig. I didn't talk to the guy that lets you open up the fast travel points. And so I looked at the map and I was like, oh my God, this is 90% sailing. Sailing sucks. And I, I, I'm going to have to go manually unlock these fast travel points. That's my mistake, admittedly. But you know, if, you're, if it's your first playthrough, you're not going to necessarily know that you can stop and talk to this guy and buy a little piece of paper that unlocks stuff. I don't think I ever did that in, in Velen or Novigrad. And if I did, it was just because I was buying up somebody's inventory and wasn't paying attention. Um, so I ended up leaving Skellige by the wayside, and I know that in doing that I missed probably, I don't know, probably eight to ten hours of solid story gameplay uh, that deals with the entire, you know, whole rights of succession of Skellige. But 
I don't necessarily feel bad in essence. I feel bad because I want to do it. Like I want to go back and play that stuff. But on the other hand, it doesn't fit in neatly. We're there very briefly on a story point of view to go with Yen and figure out what the fuck happened to Siri. We do that, and then we're supposed to just go back to Velen. I'm supposed to go pick up Uma, and then we go to Kaer Morhen and, and try to lift the curse on, on him. And then it's back to Skella again, to Skellige again to sail to the Isle of Mist. And the problem is, each of the times that we're there, I felt very much like following through the main storyline was probably the more important thing to do. I thought very briefly uh, when I was going back for the Isle of Mist that I was like, okay, I'm in Skellige. Maybe I should do some of these quests. And then I looked and I was like, oh, I don't have any fast travel points, so fuck it. I'm just going to sail to the Isle of Mist. But again, it, it lands at two separate story times that don't necessarily invite you to go along and play with the game. They, they certainly give you a couple of points that, that try to move you around Skellige in a way that you'll you'll go find some more quests and you'll do some stuff if you're willing to go and check out those quests that they've given you. The problem was the story made it so that I wasn't willing at the time to go around and look at the quests that they'd given me. I mean, I mean, I wanted to, but I also was like, eh, but Yen's here, you know, and now I gotta go series at the Isle of the Mists. I gotta go. I got, I got stuff I gotta do. Um, You know what I mean? So I feel like it, while I could blame myself for just not being willing to do that exploration, it felt like it would have taken a long time. And again, I know in the back of my mind that things are going to wait for me, but it's about what part of the story I want to see now. And after I find out that Ciri has been in a massive magical fight with somebody and that there's this freak in the Baron's castle that I can just go pick up and we can maybe get some answers, I want to do that immediately. That's the part of the story that's driving me to come and find out about it. And that's something that you do kind of after you find out about all these baseline problems. You you find out like, hey, uh, Saris is going to go help her brother. Her brother's off battling a giant, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. Go do that stuff. And then you leave with Yin and go talk to people and find out that there was a big massive battle that blew up half of a forest. So in the front of your mind, the thing that's the most pressing to me from a story standpoint and what I want to know more about is what happened with Siri. Look, we just saw there was portals and we did magic stuff and we saw what was going on. Like, what's going on? I got to follow that storyline through. I don't really care about this guy and some giant. I've never even fucking seen him before. And he's probably wearing a skirt. Who cares? Um, I make fun of the kilt, but I would wear one. Only because it keeps my balls, you know, nice draft. Anyway, maybe not in the winter. Who knows? But yeah, so so Skellige was this whole thing for me that was a problem. And, and honestly, even though I didn't know at the time, it was a bigger problem later on. We'll get into that. Um, but again, yeah, likely hours of, of core storyline in Skellige. Uh, fell by the wayside because of the island. This the the island would just sort of is underdeveloped in that it forced you to go to a place and get on a boat and then sail to another place to start the quest. Uh, it, it just doesn't work out. It didn't work out the way that they laid that out, and they need to rethink how they're going to get people invested in the in the Skellige Islands thing. I would honestly like to see some changes on that in a future patch. Doubt it's going to happen. Um, or maybe at least just give you one fast travel point on each island for free, like without having to go buy the stuff from the guy. And then you'll say, oh, okay, well, I'll pop over there. Because I would have. If I'd had a single thing on each island where there was a quest, I would have popped over to him. Uh, running into the end of the game now, because uh, we're getting there. Yeah. Uh, I'm going to complain real quick about one thing, and then we're going to talk about a larger issue uh, that I have uh, overall. The ending cards, these are the little vignettes that explain the end of character storylines and all pre-rendered scenes were quieter than the rest of the game. That's that's one, that's just a little one-off. I didn't like that. that was, they were quieter than the rest of the game, I think because they were using like real world sound effects instead of vocal sound effects and they should have been keyed uh, to the voice volume as opposed to keyed to the game volume or the background music volume. I'm not really sure, um, but that's a pretty simple fix if they want to fix that. However, my, my big problem was that these ending cards were implemented in a somewhat jarring way. They, they, they start showing them to you when you go to places just in the middle of a scene. So you walk into a room. Uh, there's one where Siri wants to go kill Horson Jr. or whatever, and you come in, and I had already killed him, so it was, it was uh, Doodoo Gravy Baden or whatever the fuck his name is. 
uh, and and he's taken over as Horson Jr. and they they give me a little a little cutscene in the middle of an in game rendered sequence where I'm talking to him, very jarring. Just pulled me straight out of it, and was was really kind of weird. And honestly, I think it could have been implemented better. And, and I'll tell you how. Rather than doing the flat um, art style cards, which I find uh, completely visually ineffective, especially when I'm coming from a game as beautiful as The Witcher 3, I would like to see them implemented more like the ending cinematics from uh, Dishonored is the game. Uh, you basically, everything, it's sort of a single still frame in the world. Nothing moves, but you still have you know all the effects rendered. Fire will be rendered, and, and, and a camera will fly through the scene and kind of artistically around the scene, and I wouldn't mind seeing that. Um, these sort of little ending things uh, shown in a way that are pre-built little sets that you fly through, even if they're pre-rendered, even if it comes up as a video. I don't mind that so much. I'd, I'd still much rather see that in any game going forward than see another set of little two-dimensional, like, drawn scenes that scribble their way onto my screen. I'm really sick of that. It's a fucking cliche. It, it, it undersells the amount of work that I've put into the game, and it, it, it tells me that you guys wanted to finish up your story with as little effort as possible when the ending is possibly one of the most important things that you can run into. That said, I will go ahead and talk about the epilogue real quick. The epilogue was pretty satisfying. You sort of jarringly cut away from the game once the, the epilogue is done. Siri goes up into the tower and we don't know what happens. And then it cuts to the epilogue where you go talk to Amir. Um, it doesn't just give you a cutscene. It gives you some stuff to do. You go riding around. Uh, in this nice little, I guess you could call it an epilogue, but really it's the ending of the game. Uh, you go riding around and you pick up a sword for Siri and you give it to her. At least I did in my ending. I think there are a couple other ones. There's the second Empress uh, ending or something like that. Um, but in, in my in my playthrough, you still get a nice little playable chunk of game after that. The problem being that at the end of the game, they then just give you that splash card where it goes shuka, 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 and draws in your ending story. It goes, Siri would go on to walk around the world with her feet and possibly stop some places and help people with her sword. Also, in the end, here, hold on, okay, there the drawing is finished and now you can see that Geralt sat in a bathtub and Yen was there too, as well as her breasts. And you know what I mean? It's just kind of like, okay, but like just, but just make that a cutscene that we fly through. Make that like a still frame that we fly through. Instead of the scribbled on shit. I can't stand it. It sells the end of the game short. It's cheap. And it could still be done cheaply, but at least in a three-dimensional way that feels good. That feels like I'm, I'm, I'm getting to voyeuristically look in on a scene with characters I love as I've come to understand them visually. At, at, to that point in the game, the loading screens were these little scribbled on sort of... Uh, cutscene things, but that's it. Like, so it doesn't make sense for the ending of the game to be to be taken out in that cheap of a way. And I honestly think that it should be. Again, that's something that I would redo now. But uh, I think that going forward, they should definitely consider that. And it upsets me. To get to my final complaint about story, and um, you know, I know I've hit the ending here of of the story overall. My final little complaint about the story is that story points still happen, and Geralt knows about them, even if you did not do them. In Skellige, I did very, very little. And beyond him knowing about the story points, the game is broken. The game expected me to do Skellige. It expected me to do more in Skellige than I did. It coded in some examples, but then it expects me to go a very specific way when you get into the castle. It expects you to turn the right way, but I didn't remember how to go through the castle, so I went the wrong way, right? In Skellige, I went upstairs and I talked to Saris and Kjalmar and... Um, I talked to Saris, and she talks about finding Hjalmar, and then I talked to Hjalmar, and he talked about his sister being the queen of the island. Ooh, very interesting, I thought to myself. Uh, weird, in fact, because I haven't done anything here, so I guess it just defaulted her to the queen. That doesn't make sense. I was like, and then I thought to myself, I was like, oh, I guess I did a little bit more of her story than I did of anybody else's. But that's interesting. So, I, and then I go downstairs, and it's not. It's it's Svalbard or Svan Svanberg. I don't I don't remember the fucking guy's name. Uh, Svan Svanriga, um, is his name. Uh, I, I I went upstairs and talked to them. He he Hjalm, Hjalm Dong uh, refers to Saris as the queen. I head back downstairs, and I see them make Svanriga the king in a cutscene. 
even and and then literally two seconds after that cutscene happens, I have a conversation that says Hjalmar and Saris have sailed off, in spite of them just being upstairs. So this also happens with uh, Geralt knowing that Emir wants to make Ciri the next empress of the whole thing. They distinctly give you the option to go talk to Emir. Or to continue on to the, uh, the the night feast thing where you kill the crones and um, Imlarith. I specifically just fuck Amir. I didn't want to go up there, and but somehow Geralt already knew about it, and, and somehow all this stuff in Skellige, Skellige had kind of happened, but it happened before the cutscene, and then the characters kind of knew about something that was wrong, and then I went downstairs, and the characters I just talked to upstairs had sailed off somewhere, you know. It really broke, and and that's a logic breakdown of of tying together character choice stories at the end of the game that needs to be fixed in a big, big way. Those are core story problems. That is a plot resolution problem. Um, everything kind of turned out fine in the end, but it's it's really weird if you've made it a point to kind of be a cunt to Amir the entire time, and then you still somehow know what his plans for Siri are, even though you never went to talk to him and nobody's literally nobody's addressed it up to this point. And so if you're not paying attention, you might miss that. You might not recognize that that's a thing that happened. And it's the same over in Skellige. I, you know what I mean? Like I knew who were up to be the king. I knew who the options were. You know, I knew who I kind of wanted it to. And I was like, well, I didn't do anything. So it'll probably be somebody else. And indeed it was, it was somebody else. But the game didn't know that until I went the right way after arriving. I, I should have gone in and turned left. I didn't. I turned right and went up some stairs. So, again, it's something that I guess their QA testers missed. And it's a real shame because it, it very much made the end of the game confusing in two kind of almost back-to-back -back things. I hear Geralt mention that, you know, Emir wants to make Siri the next empress. And then I go upstairs and talk to some people. And they say they're the queen. And I go downstairs and... It's Vonrig is being sworn in as the king. It, it, it was broken. It's just straight up broken. Um, and they need to make sure that if those story points are going to happen, that they are included in one of the loading title little things where Dandelion's talking. And I watched those, and it wasn't in there. So, yeah. Yeah, man. Let's, uh, let's move it on to conclusions. We're going to do it. And we're going to watch that little loading circle spin around for longer than I like. But there we go. That's okay. Conclusions, uh, easily, easily uh, the best game of the year all around. Uh, I mean, it, it's got a lot of love put into it. CD Projekt Red's dedication to the game, their fans, and uh, their pride of workmanship are, are something that it, it's long been missing from the higher-ups in game development. And I don't mean higher-ups as in quality. AAA game development is what it is. There are a lot of talented people working in there. What I mean is that the people in charge of the projects and their willingness to put out a game that's subpar, their willingness to to cut corners or let things fall by the wayside or cut back on their scope and vision for various reasons is something that's plagued the industry for a long, long time. And those are decisions that come from the top down. You know, sometimes a game won't work out and you'll end up with an Overwatch instead of a Titan. But a lot of times what we end up with is just a mediocre sort of game that doesn't really go anywhere and doesn't really do anything. It doesn't really leave a lasting impression on anybody. In CD Projekt Red's case, the dedication paid off. CD Projekt's effort and time spent on this game is just really a, a thing of beauty. It is a masterwork of games to this point. It is the best that the open world can be in so many ways to this point with some minor blemishes here and there, but ones that can largely be looked over in the end. Uh, it's a satisfying story at a baseline that no it leaves no unopened bleh, it leaves no opened storyline unaddressed in at least some way even if it's in sort of a minor hand wavy kind of a way that ends with title cards and it's a minor complaint that I'd love to see fixed it's got beautiful graphics that do sadly leave one wondering what an unbridled CD project could do if they didn't have to worry about console development or the limitations of lower-end computers. And really, well-rounded gameplay that stands on par with the best in the pack and above the best uh, of the rest of the pack running on much larger budgets. You've got 
you know, certainly well-rounded gameplay compared to games like Grand Theft Auto V, which I thought was a beautifully ambitious game, you know, as well as GTA Online. And you've got it standing head and shoulders above games like Fallout 4, which to my mind were an embarrassment. And they did all of this with an $81 million budget. Now, that might not sound like a small number to you, but consider that they made dozens and dozens of hours of gameplay, voice work, interactivity, et cetera, et cetera, on a budget that is less than half of what they paid to make the new Star Wars film. Well less than half, indeed, and less than it cost them to make either of the Star Trek movies. And, and again, those are an hour and a half piece of entertainment. They put together something amazing. There's no other word for it. More importantly, though, the game takes its material seriously without flinching. Horrors and flavor and an honest world devoid of the sort of compromise you see in things like Telltale's Game of Thrones series are a delight. It's the sort of thing that makes you really look forward to their next game instead of saying, well, gee, Fallout 4 was kind of fun, but I'd really rather see a new Elder Scrolls game. I, I am unabashedly and unashamedly excited for cyberpunk. I have faith in CD Projekt in a way that I've not had faith in a game company for years, and that's the thing that maybe excites me the most. It's the takeaway that knowing that they're going to care as much as I do that the next game that they put out is good, and not just good, but potentially great. Whereas people like Telltale continue to slap together things that they consider acceptable and put out even at a discount price and really becomes unacceptable. And a high end of games that produces something like Fallout 4, which is just an entire mishmash of unrealized ideas, shallow everything, and disappointed gamers if they pay more attention to anything than what names are on the box. CD Projekt has done a beautiful job here. It's rightfully gotten Game of the Year at plenty of places. It's certainly my game of 2015, and thank you guys very much for listening. That is it for this review of The Witcher 3 Wild Hunt. If you have not played it, I recommend giving it a shot. It might not be right up your alley. Uh, it is a very heavy fantasy game, but it's definitely worth a look, if for no other reason than that it is beautiful and a well-told story. If not, hey, maybe Cyberpunk will be, you know, up your alley. Either way, CD Projekt is a company to keep an eye on, and I look forward to seeing what they churn out next. That's it for me, guys. This is Wombat Goes Deep. We're talking about The Witcher 3 Wild Hunt. I'm done. Thanks for listening. We'll see you guys next time.